When Forrest Gump died. Oh. <laughs> Hold on, would you? He stood in front of St. Peter at the pearly gates. St. Peter said, welcome, Forrest. We've heard a lot about you. He continued, unfortunately, it's getting pretty crowded up here, and we find that we now have to give people an entrance exam before we can let them into heaven. Okay, said Forrest. I hope it's not too hard. I've already been through a test. My mama used to say that life is like a final exam. It's hard. Yes, Forrest, I know, but this test is only three questions. And here they are. Which two days of the week begin with the letter T? How many seconds are in a year? And what is God's first name? Well, sir, said Forrest, the first one is easy. Which two days of the week begin with the letter T? Today. 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 Tomorrow. St. Peter looked surprised and said, well, that wasn't the answer I was looking for, but you have a point. I give you credit for that answer. The next question said, Forrest, how many seconds are in a year? Twelve, replied Forrest. Twelve, said St. Peter, surprised and confused. Yes, St. Peter, January 2nd, February 2nd, March 2nd. <laughs> St. Peter interrupted him, and I see what you mean. I'll have to give you credit for that one, too. And the last one, the last question said for us, what is God's first name? It's Andy. Andy, said St. Peter. How did you come up with Andy? Well, I learned it in church. We used to sing about it. Forrest broke into the song, Andy walks with me, and he talks with me. <laughs> St. Peter opened the gate to heaven and said, run, Forrest, run. <laughs> That's good. Are we on that again? Does God answer every prayer? And why is prayer so important? I call this message the basics of prayer. I think they agree with it back there. <laughs> but you know, we've got to cover the basics before we can go past the basics. Some of you may be way past the basics when it comes to prayer. I ask you to bear with me and just go with me for a little bit. So why is prayer so important? Prayer is our way of communicating with God. Communication is a two-way street. First thing we need to learn when we become a Christian is prayer. One of the first, the basic things that we need to learn how to do is pray. Part of learning to pray is learning to listen. It's 
why I call it communicating with their Heavenly Father. Can't communicate without listening. Can you imagine a husband and wife not talking? Some of you are shaking your heads no. <laughs> How about, can you remember when you first courted? You go out on a date. And then what would happen if you just both sat there and never said a word to each other? How far do you think that relationship would have gone? How, how long do you think that relationship would have lasted? Or, let me take it a step further. Husband and wife never spending any time with each other. Never spending time together, never saying, I love you. So let me try this this morning. If you haven't said, I love you to your spouses this morning, go ahead and do it now. Well, I'm glad I didn't hear too much out there. Now, some of you are thinking, okay, what's this got to do with prayer? <coughs> The amount of prayer in your life is directly related to the amount of growth that you have in your life with the Lord. And Jesus has set the example for us when it comes to prayer. And I want to look at some of the examples that are in the Word for us this morning. Let's look first at Mark chapter 1, verse 35. And it reads like this. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. He got up early in the morning, and he went out by himself and found a quiet place to commune with his heavenly Father. <coughs> Mark chapter 6, verse 46, and when he had sent them away, he went to the mountain to pray. In other words, he, he got by himself. He spent that time by himself to pray. Mark chapter 14, verse 38 and 39, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he sent or he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. Watch and pray. The spirit of need is willing, but the flesh is weak. In other words, we really want to do it. We really want to spend the time in prayer. But you know, in this busy life, there are so many distractions that come between us and the time that we need to be spending in prayer. I'm sure that every one of you here this morning could tell me that if you knelt down on your knees or you sat down in a chair, wherever you spend time in prayer, the minute you decide that you're going to spend time in prayer or reading the Word, a thousand different thoughts start flooding into your mind. Uh, all those different things start coming at you and you're going, wait. God, no, I don't want that happening. I want to have a quiet time with you. You begin thinking of all the things that you've got to go do throughout the day. You want to. And that's why he says the spirit of need is willing, but the flesh is weak. Another thing I want to add here is so you have to determine that that's what you're going to do. But you need to put all those other things out of your mind. Say, God, I'm here to spend time with you. Luke chapter 5, 16 says, So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. He himself, being Jesus himself, took that time. And what a sight to pray. Luke 9, 18, and it happened as he was alone praying. Amen. Again. He spent that quiet time with the Lord. Luke chapter 22, verses 41, 42, and then I'm going to skip down to 44. It says like this. 
And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Verse 44, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweats became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Not my will. It's another key having to do with prayer. It's not my will that this prayer is all about. It's about our Heavenly Father's will. He knelt down and he prayed. And then it says he prayed so earnestly the sweat became like great drops of blood. He was intense. This was at the time of his life that he was facing going to the cross. And he's crying out to God. Now, you've got to remember this is a human being and he's crying out to God. He wants, he wants the will of his Father. And he's on his knees saying, God, not my will, but yours be done. Now, we need to get a hold of these scriptures. One more I want to give to you this morning, James chapter 5, 16. I'm going to give you just a minute to turn to that. James chapter 5, 16. This is what it says. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now I'm sure you've You've heard that scripture many, many times. Many times. But I, I want to throw one thing out at you this morning. Now we hit this, this not this particular scripture, but I, I gave you this point last week. And pray one for another. Now what's it say after that? That you may be healed. Interesting, isn't it? I remember my dad when he was pastoring here. He was sick. He had poison oak until I wasn't. He had poison oak before it was. And somebody needed prayer. So he, it was just natural to go pray for people. He was healed instantly of that poison oak as he prayed. For somebody else. Instantly. And pray one for another that you may be healed. Now the next portion of that scripture says the effectual. Effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Pray one for another. Effectual, meaning effective. That word effectual means they're going in a way that, or they're praying in a way that gets the job done. So you might ask yourself, is my prayer effectual? It's a new word for some. Is my prayer effectual? Is your prayer effectual? What kind of results do you have when you go before God in prayer? I want you to think about that for a moment. Now, when I first read this scripture, I thought, man, God, I don't have a chance. I don't have a chance here. And I read the word righteous. Righteous is living a life that's pleasing to God. And I thought, you know, I'm not perfect. I do my best to serve God. I pray. I study. But I'm not perfect. Therefore, I can't have effective prayer. Think about that for a second. Excuse me. 
What this is really saying is if I regard sin in my heart, or if I say sin is okay, knowing it's not, God's not going to answer my prayer. You say, where do you get that from? Psalm chapter 66, verse 18 says, If I regard sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now look at it this way. If you pray for something that's wrong, what do you think God's response is going to be? I had somebody tell me one time that they were going to do something that I knew was wrong, and I knew that they knew it was wrong. They told me, well, Craig, I prayed about it, and God said no, but then I prayed again, and he didn't answer me, so I'm just going to go ahead and do it. <laughs> Can you believe that? That's an actual, actual happening. So what's wrong with this picture? Remember Psalm 66, 18? Just going back a little bit. If I regard sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. They knew it wasn't right. God had told them no, but they decided they were just going to pray again, and God didn't answer them so well. That must be okay, because he didn't respond to me that time. Now, I have some friends that pray about everything. And when I mean pray about everything, well, what should I eat today, God? Is it okay if I go to Eureka? Uh, can, can I go, you know, I mean, this is, this is sincerely. And then I have friends that don't pray about anything. You know, one thing that we need to understand is we need to establish a pattern or a habit of prayer. Make it a habit to pray. Well, I don't know if I want to do it that way. Well, that's how you establish a pattern. Set aside time each day to spend with God. Make it a habit. Establish your relationship with Him. Like I said earlier, we need to have a relationship with God just like we need to have that relationship with our spouses. Prayer. Here's something else. We tend to make things so complicated. We make things harder than what they should be. Remember, prayer is merely communicating with our Heavenly Father. And that's not meant to sound trivial at all. But it's true. It's communicating with your Heavenly Father. I want to share with you some ways that I have prayed recently. And maybe you can relate to this. Just simple prayers. God, I can't find my wallet. I need help. And that's okay. God, I locked my keys in the truck again. <laughs> And yet, you might chuckle. But I'm communicating with my Heavenly Father about some things that trouble me. Basically, my memory. And I, I remember, just a few years back, we were up, we got church for Sunday morning, and I locked my keys in the truck. Well, we have a guy there that is a tow truck driver. So after church was over, I knew I had done it before church had even begun, but after church was over, I said, would you kind of help me out here? And he goes out to start to get into the truck, and I'm going, oh man, please don't break that window, please. You know, and I'm looking at all the ways he's trying, and it's not working. The little kid comes into the church and says, great, great. Do you, do you know what your code is for your keypad on the door? Yeah. It's that simple to get into my truck. You know, it's got that button on there. 
God, I love so-and-so, and, you know, would you just bless them and the things that they're going to be facing today? Yesterday, I had a man come to the office and said, Pastor, my grandma is really sick. Would you please pray for him? I just put my arms around him, and we bowed our heads right in the office, and the guy was just pouring out a bucket of tears. He loved his grandma so much. And you don't have to pray any kind of fancy prayer. It's just God minister to this guy. God help him through this tough time in his life. I had a friend this past week call me and said, I need a job. Do you know any jobs that are open? I said, let's pray. We prayed. Two days later, she called me and says, I got a job. You know, God wants us to ask. God wants our love. God wants us to have that relationship with Him. A loving relationship with Him. Because God wants to give us those things that we need. Matthew chapter 7 verse 11 says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? I had somebody else call me this past week and says, Remember you prayed for me last Sunday? Yeah. It's all working out. Just touched my heart so much. The Bible is full of people just like you and I. Just plain, ordinary people. They haven't been glamorized. Make them look any better. I want to look as I want us to look at a couple of these guys. Peter and John. Peter and John went to the temple. When they got there, there's a lame man that was carried to the gate of the temple daily to ask for money. The lame man expected Peter and John to give him something. The scripture kind of puts it like this. Peter, when they walked up there, he fixed his eyes on him. He looked at him, just stared him right in the eyeballs. And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. But what I do have, I'll give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Rise up and walk. I want to read that in the Message Bible. It says, Peter said, I don't have a nickel to my name. But you know what I do have? I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. And he grabbed him by the right hand and pulled him up. And in, in, in an instant, his feet and ankles became firm. He jumped up to his feet and he walked. You know, we may not have a lot of things for people. We may not be able to help people monetarily or other ways. But you can offer them something in prayer that they don't have. And that's the love of Jesus Christ. It says immediately again, back to the King James, it says immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. He jumped up and walked into the temple with Peter and John. And the lame man was so excited. He was so excited that he made a lot of noise. And everyone saw him praising God and wondering what was going on. And that opened the door for Peter and John to begin preaching and begin teaching in the temple. And as they began doing that, they noticed out of the sight of their eyes that there's some um, people coming in. And they knew that they were the priests and the Sadducees. And they came and they took Peter and John into custody. They wanted to silence it. Everybody knew there had been a miracle that day. Anyone that was anywhere close to the temple knew that there had been a miracle that day. They wanted to silence it. They wanted to 
make clients. They wanted it to go away. There's a lot more to that story, and I'm not going to go into that. I'm going to leave that for another week here. I want you to know something here. Peter and John prayed for the lame man, and he was healed. And in addition to that, there's 5,000 men who were saved as a result of Peter and John's obedience. Can you imagine if we were obedient to our Heavenly Father in prayer, what you would begin to see happening in your life? What I would begin to see happening in my life if we were obedient to what God spoke to our hearts to do. I want you to see what Acts 4.13 says about Peter and John. I'm not going to turn there. You can turn there. But this is what it says. It says they were uneducated. They were untrained. Now, I'm not going to say you're a bunch of uneducated, untrained people. But you know what? I look at myself that way. Yes, I study. But as we try to figure out the ways of God, we complicate things so much that we no longer become effective. Peter and John were uneducated and untrained, but they let God use their voice. They let God speak to their hearts and pray for this guy. And that's what they did. And not only was he healed, but 5,000 other people came to know the Lord that very day. Thank you, Lord. If he can use Peter and John, he can use you, and he can use me. Recently, I had a homeless man. I was getting gas down here at the Shell Station. And I heard this voice, Pastor! He was up in the Century parking lot yelling at me all the way down at the Shell Station. <laughs> I looked up and saw him. I said, hey, how you doing? Yelling back at him. <laughs> and we started to go on to meet each other. And he came to me at the Shell Station, and he put his arms around me and said, Pastor, I want to pray for you. I know people that would turn away from that because they don't want to get dirty or get smelly or whatever. He said, Pastor, I want to pray for you. And he put his arms around me, and this is how he prayed. God, I pray that you bless Pastor. God, strengthen him. Amen. I melted right there. He left, and I couldn't keep crying all the way home. I don't care who you are. You can minister to somebody in the name of the Lord. God used him to touch my heart, to milk me. And I haven't forgotten it to this day, and I never will forget that time. If he can use A man dressed in camel skin and eating locusts and wild honey. God can use you. He can use you. James chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. Here it says, Elijah was an ordinary guy just like you and I, and we talked about that a few weeks ago. 
He prayed and it didn't rain, and then he prayed again and it rained. You know what? It doesn't matter what your status in life is. You may be very successful in life, or you may be someone living in one of our homeless camps. God wants you. Prayer isn't about me. Prayer isn't about you. Prayer is about Him and our communication with Him. Prayer is about our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And prayer is coming to know what God wants in our lives, not what we want. This is the beginning. Some messages on prayer that I just want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. God wants to move in your life. The first thing you need to do is establish an effective time in your life to be on your knees, be in your closet, to be on your seat, in your chair, wherever it is, to spend time with your Heavenly Father. If you want to see your life go somewhere in Him, you got to make that a habit. you got to make that time a special time. I know we're busy. Every one of us in here is busy. But no matter what you do, you've got to carve out that time in your life. Say, Heavenly Father, help me to have that time with you. I've tried to make this this morning so that you can understand it doesn't matter who you are, you can have an effective prayer life. I want to ask you just a couple of questions in closing this morning. <coughs> questions I want you to ask yourself. It's, what is the greatest trial you've had recently in your life? Do you see defeat in that trial? Or do you see victory in that trial? And then I want you to, as we begin to pray this morning, I want you to trust God for the victory. You can do it. Don't try to pray a fancy prayer. Say, God, I need your help. God, open the keys. Get those keys and open the door of my car. Just as simple as that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning I just thank you for your love for me, Lord. And I love you. I love you, Lord. God, I believe that each one here loves you also. Father, I pray that you help us to take that time, to spend time with you, no matter how busy we are in our lives. God, that we make it a habit, communicate with you. God, I want to have that effective time in my life that when I speak, you answer <coughs> When I make a request to you, Lord, that you hear and respond and we see things happening in our lives as a result of that, Lord. And I thank you for that. I thank you for that, Lord. God, you're an awesome God. You want to give your children those good gifts. Those things that we need in our lives. I thank you, Lord. Amen.